Hi, welcome to measuring muon g minus 2. In this video, we're going to give a discussion of the principles behind how the Fermilab muon g minus 2 experiment measured g minus 2 of the muon. This discussion will be less technical than that given in the April 7th Fermilab seminar. An important point that I should make up front is that there are lots of important experimental details that I'll be leaving out. So perhaps it's best to think of this as a spherical cow explanation of how g minus 2 is measured. This video will probably make a lot more sense if you've already watched the video What is G-2 of the Muon? Part 1. Okay, so I'll give some references that I used in preparing this video. First, there are two of the recent papers from the Muon G-2 experiment that came out with the recent result. Next, there's the Muon G-2 Technical Design Report, or TDR. And lastly, there are a couple of conference notes from the last couple of years which I found useful. Links to all of these references are given in the description below. Okay, so let's get started by talking about what happens to muons in a magnetic field. So let's say we have a uniform magnetic field B pointing up. Into this field, we place a muon. Oh, scratch that. Into this field, we place an anti-muon, a mu plus, as that's what the experiment uses. The mu plus has a spin that we call S. As we saw in the video, what is G minus 2 of the muon part 1, the mu plus also has a magnetic moment, denoted mu sub mu. We show an expression for the magnetic moment here. Q sub mu plus is the charge of the mu plus, and M is the muon mass. The magnetic moment is also proportional to this important parameter, G. Because the charge of the mu plus is positive, the magnetic moment points in the same direction as the spin. The interaction of the magnetic field B and the magnetic moment causes the spin axis to rotate around the B field direction. This is a phenomenon known as Larmor precession. The angular frequency of this precession called omega sub s, or the spin frequency, has two terms. If you've seen Larmor precession before, you might have seen an expression containing only the first term. Now, this first term contains g, which is what we're interested in measuring. The second term is a relativistic correction. Here, gamma is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, where v is the velocity of the mu plus, and c is the speed of light. We can slightly rewrite this expression. In doing so, we find that there is a term that depends on g minus 2. We'll come back to this expression shortly. Now, this is not the only thing that happens to a muon in a magnetic field. The mu plus will also interact with the magnetic field in a way that doesn't involve the spin. Here, let's take a uniform magnetic field pointing out of the screen. We're going to send in a particle with charge Q and velocity V. This will produce a force on the particle perpendicular to the velocity v and the magnetic field b. This force will cause the particle to move in a circle.
The particle will revolve around at the cyclotron frequency omega c. Let's compare this to the spin or Larmor precession frequency that we saw earlier. So here we give the expression for the spin and cyclotron frequencies for the antimuon. Notice that they're both proportional to the charge and the magnetic field and inversely proportional to the mass. In fact, let's pretend for a moment that g equals 2. In this case, the g minus 2 term in the spin frequency is 0. And if we block out the g minus 2 term and look a bit closer, we can see that if g equals 2, then the spin frequency and the cyclotron frequency are equal. OK, so let's continue on pretending that g equals 2. We'll put a mu plus in a magnetic field B that is pointing out of the screen. The muon is moving to the right. We saw earlier that it will go in a circle, shown in purple. The muon spin is pointing to the right, indicated by the black arrow. Let's see what happens to the muon spin as time goes on. So, here we show the muon's position and spin after going one-eighth the way around the circle. Here it has gone one-quarter of the way around the circle, and the spin has rotated 90 degrees. When the anti-muon is halfway around the circle, the spin has rotated 180 degrees. When the mu plus gets back to its starting position, the spin has also rotated around by a full 360 degrees. OK, that was what happens if g equals 2. But g doesn't equal 2, so the story will be a bit more complicated. OK, so let's define a new quantity. This quantity is omega a and it's the difference between the spin frequency omega s and the cyclotron frequency omega c. The cyclotron frequency, the last term on the first line, cancels out the 2 over gamma term in the spin frequency. This makes omega a proportional to g minus 2. And since the anomalous magnetic moment a mu is just g minus 2 divided by 2, Omega A is directly proportional to the anomalous magnetic moment. OK, so let's repeat our previous exercise for G greater than 2. Again, we'll start with the mu plus at the top of the screen with its spin pointing to the right. Here we see the situation when the anti-muon has done 1 eighth of a revolution. The spin is rotating slightly faster this time. Here it is after one quarter of a revolution. The spin has rotated more than 90 degrees. When the anti-muon is halfway around, the spin has rotated more than 180 degrees. Here the mu plus is almost back to where it started. And OK, here the anti-muon, now shown in blue, has completed one full revolution and is back to where it started. The spin has rotated more than one full turn. So this mismatch between the spin and cyclotron frequencies measures the anomalous magnetic moment a mu. But this means that experimentally one needs to be able to measure the spin direction. So let's see how that's done. OK, so to do that, we need to talk about how a muon decays. An antimuon decays almost all the time to a positron, a muon antineutrino, and an electron neutrino. Here's the Feynman diagram for the decay. We're using the convention that the arrow direction is reversed on antiparticle lines. 
In the decay, the neutrinos will escape undetected, so we're mostly interested in what happens to the positron. Now, the positron can emerge from the decay with a range of momenta. Let's look at a couple of cases. So here, let's consider an antimuon at rest. It will decay and leave a positron, a neutrino, and an antineutrino in its place. Let's say the neutrino and antineutrino go off to the left, and the positron goes off to the right. Due to momentum conservation, the positron in this scenario will be very energetic. On the other hand, we could also imagine that the antimuon decays by the neutrino and antineutrino, each carrying off almost half of the muon rest energy, with only a little energy left over for the positron. In this case, the positron isn't so energetic. Okay, so now let's complicate things a bit further by taking into account the antimuon spin. Again, the antimuon is at rest. Here's a highly non-trivial fact. When the positron is highly energetic, it is more likely to be emitted in a direction roughly aligned with the antimuon spin. This is important for determining the spin direction, as we'll shortly see. Okay, so that was for an antimuon at rest. But the antimuons in the G-2 experiment are moving at high speed. So let's see how that affects what we just saw. Now let's take an antimuon with the spin pointing to the right and moving to the right with a speed v. As before, in the rest frame of the antimuon, highly energetic positrons are more likely to be emitted along the spin axis, which here is to the right. But now, because the antimuon is moving to the right, these energetic positrons get an additional boost. And this means that their energy, measured in the lab, will be large. Now, let's see what happens if the antimuon was instead moving to the left. Again, in the rest frame of the antimuon, the most energetic positrons are emitted along the spin axis, which is to the right. But because the original antimuon is moving to the left, the energy of the positron measured in the lab will be much smaller than what we saw in the previous case when the antimuon was also moving to the right. Let's see how this is useful for determining the spin direction. So let's define a threshold energy, E threshold. If the antimuon is moving in the same direction as its spin is pointing, the positron emitted in its decay is more likely to have high energy, and thus more likely to have an energy above E threshold. If the antimuon is moving in the opposite direction as its spin is pointing, the positron emitted in its decay is more likely to have low energy, and thus more likely to have an energy below E threshold. So now, let's move on to seeing how the spin direction is determined. We saw that the antimuon spin precesses relative to the velocity vector with the angular frequency omega a the difference between the spin and cyclotron frequencies. The rate of antimuon decays with positron energy greater than E threshold will also oscillate at this same frequency, omega A. So, to find omega A, measure the rate of positrons with energy above E threshold as a function of time. If you do, you'll get a plot that looks schematically something like this. On the horizontal axis, we have time, 
and on the vertical axis we have the rate of positrons with energy above E threshold. The angular frequency of these oscillations is omega A. And omega A gives you the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. That's what we're looking for. As a side note, let's also look at one other feature of this plot. Aside from the wiggles, the rate is also dying off exponentially with time. What is going on here? Well, the antimuons are decaying, so as time goes by, there are fewer of them to produce positrons. Now, the lifetime of the antimuon is 2.2 microseconds. Let's say you have a collection of n antimuons at rest. If you wait after 2.2 microseconds, you'll have n over e, which is about 0.37 times n of them left, up to statistical fluctuations. So let's take another look at that exponential decay. Here we've marked the height of the red line at t equals 0 in the top line. Below that we've drawn another line at the t equals 0 height multiplied by 0 0.37. The red line will cross this bottom line when the population of muons has dropped by approximately a factor of e. So where does that happen? It happens at 64 microseconds, not 2.2 microseconds. So what is happening here? So here's what's going on. These antimuons are not at rest. Instead, they have an energy of about 3.1 GeV. The mass of an antimuon is about 106 MeV over C squared. What we're seeing here is relativistic time dilation. To compute the size of the effect, we can note that gamma, which is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, which is also equal to the energy over mc squared, is 29.3. This is the time dilation factor. If we multiply 2.2 microseconds by 29.3, we get 64 microseconds. So you can check out figures in either of the two recent papers from the muon g-2 experiment mentioned previously to see this demonstration of relativistic time dilation for yourself. Okay, so let's very briefly summarize. Here we looked at the principles behind the recent measurement by the Fermilab muon g-2 experiment. For more info, you can check out the references given earlier and listed in the description below. And if you haven't already seen it, check out the April 7th seminar from Fermilab.